Thank you for being here, Governor. We're going to start uh, right off with a question from the audience right here in front of you. My name is Ken Gregerson. I became a caregiver in 2012 when my wife was diagnosed with Alzheimer's. Since then, I've made it my mission to help others in my position by facilitating support groups and bringing people together to reduce the stigma of the disease and embrace the journey. I'm one of 16 million Americans that provides unpaid care for their loved ones with Alzheimer's or other forms of dementia. And we incur substantial costs managing this disease. If elected president, what will you do to address Alzheimer's as a public health crisis that is only going to get worse exponentially if not dealt with now? Well, Ken, thank you for the question. I'm so sorry. That's, I've been up close and personal in those situations myself, and I know. Sorry. Uh, Alzheimer's and, and other forms of dementia uh, have grown at a rate exceeding anybody's expectations. Uh, the most recent estimate I just saw that by 2050, in 2019 dollars, we'll be spending $1.5 trillion per year on, on these various forms of dementia. And, and there's no clear miracle drug in, in, in the offing. The burden that it puts on the families, especially the, the close members of families, is almost, know, almost unbearable. There are certain organizations now that are setting up and, and able to uh, provide their, the, the places where normally a, a paid caregiver would come in. Uh, we are creating the systems whereby we will be able to provide and pay family members or neighbors or other people that are uh, operating as caregivers and be able to compensate you for uh, that cost, uh, in, many in many cases, lost income. I think we also need to address the issues around paid leave. And one of my staff said that, you know, if you distill it down, there are three places that, that paid leave matters. Is when someone has a child, when someone's very sick, and when someone is an older adult uh, and then has, a, has a, a, a disease of some sort. And that last one is obviously the hardest for, for almost everyone. So that we should get to a national model. As a president, I would lead that effort to, to have a paid leave system that includes all three and in a, in a fair way that doesn't put our, our businesses and our co commerce at risk, but provides Americans the opportunity to, to live in dignity with their families. Before we leave the topic, um, there is a shortage of direct care workers in this country, in addition to uh, professional health care staff in places like Iowa. What would you do as president to uh, not only help the at-home caregiver like Mr. Gregerson, but to make sure people have an opportunity if, and can afford to hire somebody uh, if they need it? Well, we have a shortage of, of of all kinds of jobs right now, but especially uh, in healthcare and especially in rural areas. Uh, we see that everywhere. Part of what we did in Colorado, uh, we got to near universal healthcare coverage. Uh, part of that was by expanding Medicaid. Part of that was by creating, I think arguably, arguably the most innovative and successful um, healthcare exchange. So providing sliding scale, scale subsidies to get more people to get private insurance. Part of that effort, expanding Medicaid, was to make sure that our rural hospitals and our rural clinics uh, are successful. Uh, obviously, we need more resources, and I don't think there's any way to beat around that bush. But we've also got to look at what are the ways we deliver health care most effectively and most efficiently. And you know, when I was a kid in college, when I was a kid, I'm 67, so I am with you in, <laughs> in every real way. Uh, but in, in 1973, uh, I helped a friend of mine named Mark Maselli start a community health center in Middletown, Connecticut, uh, one of the very early community health centers. And that, his institute, his company, his nonprofit, has now over 200 different locations. 
and they do a sliding scale for pretty much every service they provide. The quality of their health care is remarkably high. They train nurse family uh, or uh, uh, nurse practitioners to, to be able to provide better quality of care. And I think organizations like uh, federally uh, uh, recognized community health centers and making sure that we have uh, organizations like nurse family practitioners where they go out and help lower income families. This is one of the key ingredients to make sure that we get quality to all parts of our country. Governor, in 2017, you and Ohio Governor John Kasich came up with your own health care <laughs> proposal. Um, it included incentives for uh, providing care in rural areas and actual subsidies to insurance companies if they covered the most expensive patients. Do you view that as the best path forward? Or what about this proposal that the former vice president has offered today, a public option? So we have, um, when John Kasich and I got together on this, I mean, we were just trying to save the Affordable Care Act. To be honest, uh, President Trump had gotten elected. He had made no secret that he wanted to rip it apart. And he had the votes in the Senate as it stood. We had two other Republicans who were willing to, to support co continuing the Affordable Care Act, and we needed that one other vote. And uh, I went to all the other you know, uh, Republican governors. I couldn't get anyone, even the, my friends and moderates, couldn't get anyone else to come along. And, and for a variety of reasons, John Kasich was my partner in that. And one thing that we shared was the enormous challenge that, rural, that, that maintaining quality and cost in rural parts of America uh, is a, has to be a priority. Uh, he's got the issue in, in Ohio, we've got the issue here. I think, that, and I started this oh, oh, six months ago or nine months ago, talking about a public option uh, that could be Medicare or maybe some combination of Medicare or Medicare Advantage. I like telemedicine if you're gonna maintain quality in rural America. But a public option, if it's done properly, allows people the choice to migrate to that public option and if it's successful and it works for people, more people will migrate. As it, as it grows in size, the cost will come down, the quality will improve, more people will migrate. Ultimately, you could end up with a, with a Medicare for all type solution, but it would be an evolution, not a revolution. And it would take you know, 10 or 15 years. And I think that's what we've been saying for quite a while now, that, that that type of approach is better than, when you talk about Medicare for all, I mean, it's hard to imagine 180 million people, and I realize it's many people are unhappy with their private insurance, but it's hard to imagine 180 million people giving up their, their private insurance. Many of them don't want to. Just a quick follow-up. Many of your competitors are supportive of the Medicare for All concept. You have called some proposals socialism. Do you believe that to be <laughs> socialism? I think socialism, the, the label should, shouldn't get in our way. I, I do think the Democrats should be very careful and draw a clear line that we are not socialists, and I don't think we are, but we know from experience in the midterms, and we know from what we already see on TV, that the president and the Republicans are going to call us socialists no matter what we do. I don't think that means we embrace massive expansions of government. What we've done in Colorado, we got to near universal health care coverage by innovation in our exchanges, by expanding Medicaid, by, by really improving how we did health care. We attack climate change, uh, not by guaranteeing every American adult a job, a federal job, which is what the, the, the Green New Deal did. What we did was we attacked methane emissions and closed coal-fired generation plants, but doing it always in a cost-effective way. So I don't, I'm not sure they're socialism per se, but I do believe that these massive expansions of government are not the best way to create the progress that most Americans expect. That 2017 plan that you advanced did not deal with the cost of prescription drugs, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken. And, uh, but that is uh, turning out to be one of the biggest failings of the Affordable Care Act. What's your plan today? Well, I think we need to, and I think the, the plan should include everything even beyond drugs, but drugs is a good place to start. Uh, the inflation, and what we spend for health care has been close to double the consumer price index, the CPI, for decades. And we've kind of looked the other way. 
and yet it continues to suck resources away from all manner of other government important infrastructure. I step back and I look, uh, I mean, we're almost, by next year we'll be at 19% of our GDP. I'm not aware of any other countries that are above 11%. There's a lot of opportunity for us to find savings. And drugs are a great place to start. For reasons that were very good 20 and 30 and 40 years ago, Congress allowed drug companies certain benefits, such as you know, that the federal government would not use the scale of their purchases, right? Look how many drugs we buy for Medicare, and yet we're not a allowed to negotiate a group discount in this country. We are the only industrialized country that doesn't. So that's a good place to start. Why not have a little transparency? And we can see what the different medical plans are charging for their pharmace pharmaceuticals that they acquire. Let's see what other countries are paying. Uh, Let's make sure that Americans get the same deal everybody else does. So in terms of pharmaceutical, I think that's, that's a great place to start. But I also think that all Americans, but I think older Americans especially, should, should be looking at the healthcare system as a whole. Because as long as we are, I would argue, wasting significant amounts of resources, everybody's healthcare is somewhat you know, unstable. I won't say at risk, but, but we all have a vested interest in making sure that our systems work effectively. President Trump proposed some of the same things that you just did, including working on price transparency. Um, they were not able to do that. They've backed off of that. Uh, the Trump administration's abandoned its idea of giving direct discounts to consumers uh, for government drug plans and instead will maintain them for the pharmacy benefit managers, those PBMs you hear about. So if, if they can't do it, why can you? Ah, oh, that Trump. Um, the uh, President Trump is a master at division, and that's perhaps his core political strategy, in my opinion. I realize there are a number of, 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 of Trump supporters, and I'm one of those rare people. I never ran for political office before I ran for mayor of Denver when I was 50 years old, uh, 49 years old. I became 50 in the campaign, uh, but I never ran for student council or class president. Uh, and my political strategy is I've never done an attack ad. I've never attacked an opponent because I think after the election, you do have to bring people together and you have to be able to address these big challenges that we're facing as a country. And I hold myself up as the one candidate who's actually done the big progressive achievements that everyone else is pretty much talking about. And I think part of how I come at getting people to sit down and talk together we got the oil and gas industry to sit down with the environmental community. They hate each other. I mean, they, it's worse than the Hatfields and the McCoys. And the, what, what, I, what I learned in the restaurant business is people have to feel heard. And oftentimes you have to repeat back to them their exact words that they're using for them to feel validated and heard. And once you begin doing that, oftentimes a strange transformation happens because you're saying their words, and by saying them, you hear the words in a different place. And suddenly you begin to get a little bit of trust. And I tease my staff, I, I mean, once you begin to get a little bit of trust, you begin to be able to collaborate. And I tease my staff that we collaborate at the speed of trust. And m many people have told me that, well, that's not, it worked with the environmentalists and the oil and gas, it's never gonna work in Washington. People are people. And it takes time and it's hard work. When I first got elected mayor, the city of Denver hated the suburbs. The suburbs mostly Republicans. Uh, Denver was democratic, strongly democratic, and there were several other, like bolder, very liberal uh, cities in the metropolitan area. We got, in, 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 a, in two years, we got all 34 municipalities in the, metro mayor, uh, in, the, in the Denver metropolitan area to unanimously support 122 miles of, of light rail track, the largest, ambitious, largest, most ambitious transit initiative in modern American history. These mayors hated each other before I got elected. It's just a function of going out and really listening to what people really need. So often people don't understand that, that someone who's arguing will have a different point, uh, perspective. And so w President Trump's failure to actually be able to deliver on his promises for, for health care and compromise, I think it has partly to do, or a significant amount to do, with how he approaches things and how he approaches people. 57 is the average age of the Iowans who are getting cannabis. 
for medical purposes from five state licensed facilities. I wondered how long it would take you to get a cannabis question for me. <laughs> <laughs> you, you've had a, a bit of a conversion on marijuana legalization. As president, what would you pursue in terms of regulations and enforcing the law? So I opposed the legalization of recreational marijuana five years ago in Colorado. I was worried about spikes in teenage consumption. I was worried about driving while high. We have seen none of that. And there's no denying that the old system where we sent, we spent, we sent hundreds of thousands of kids, we sent millions of kids to prison, in many cases made them felons. I think more importantly, we didn't recognize that a system where so many people break the law is in itself un unhealthy. What we did in Colorado, uh, we, I did the very best I could, even though I posed it, to see if we could make it work. It's what the Quakers call a fair witness. And, and it is working. It's not perfect. There's still problems. But I will tell you one thing that's interesting. Of, I can tell you, we do a public health survey every two years. We 24,000 people all in the state of Colorado. So I can tell you with a fair amount of certainty that we haven't seen any spike in teenagers or people in their 20s or 30s. We haven't seen a spike in any demographic except older adults. <laughs> and, and if you're over 65, we see a pretty significant increase. And my argument there is, look at how the stability of any other Democrat. That's because the, the older adults are clearly seeing a medical benefit to it. So as president, what I would do, I, I don't think the president or, or the Congress should come tell each state they should legalize it or not. Uh, we didn't do that with alcohol when we repealed the Volstead Act and prohibition. We shouldn't do it now. But I think we should decertify marijuana as a Schedule I narcotic because right now we can't even test it for its medical benefits. We know it works for certain types of seizures and, and autism, but we don't know what the side effects are. Let's test it like a real pharmaceutical. Let's make sure that banks in states that choose to legalize it, banks can bank it so people can use a charge card to write a check, which they can't right now in Colorado. Uh, let's make sure that it's decriminalized so that the, 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 it's not against federal law to even have possession. And I think when you look at those basic things and, and begin to allow the, uh, the FDA to do the testing required to really see what kind of a, a safe drug it is, uh, the Department of Agriculture to make sure that we use the right pesticides. So I say let the states that choose to legalize it either medically or recreationally, make sure that they can do it in, without being in conflict with federal law. Because I can tell you that's no fun. What, a, what about other drugs that... Um, what about other drugs that people use recreationally? I mean, the, there's an interest from some in the country to decriminalize all, all types of drugs, even um, narcotics, um, to get away from that war on drugs, law enforcement, and treat it as a health care issue. Where do you stand on that? So I think that the, 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 the state of Colorado as a laboratory for democracy has demonstrated that what most people, including myself, thought was going to be a bad idea, turned out to work better than we expected. And I think there are other states right now looking at uh, moving into other drugs and narcotics and, and using the same type of permissive approach where the person taking the drug is not seen as a criminal, they're seen more as a victim. Uh, and I, you know, I, I don't think we should ru rush headstrong into a new decision but I definitely support states going in and trying to figure out a new system to see if we can make our, our society better and stronger. Governor, the AARP has strong opinions about Social Security. One of your competitors have said that were you in office at the time Social Security was ratified, you might have voted against it. Um, <laughs> what are your views in terms of preserving the system? Well, first, I would never, uh, I would never support extending the, 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 the requirement of age, because I think that disadvantages people who need Social Security the most. So I wouldn't raise the age uh, before you uh, can begin to utilize it, either in Social Security or Medicare. Uh, obviously, we have a funding issue. I think that's not as impossible to resolve as people say. We have a, a wage cap 
on, on, you know, in other words, 6.2% of people's wages pay for, uh, you know, provide the funding for Social Security. But it stops at, I think, what is $131,000, something like that now. We need to raise that cap so that wealthier wage earners pay, you know, a, 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 a fair share of their uh, support for the overall, uh, overall Social Security. I also think we should find some way of augmenting it. If you look at how few Americans, 60% of Americans don't have additional retirement beyond Social Security, that's not good. Why don't we have something portable that people pay in and maybe it could be managed within the Social Security fund, but pay in one third from the business, one third from the worker, and then one third from the federal government, but it goes with you wherever you work. Look at all these young people in the gig economy. Look at older people that move from uh, uh, different jobs. That's the kind of thing we got. Let's get, take off the, sh the, the blinders and begin looking at things that will not just preserve what we have, but really improve what we need. Personal accounts under Social Security has, have been suggested before, but uh, there were, it was a lot of pushback because people thought it would undermine the Social Security system, the traditional Social Security system. Younger people wouldn't want to participate, and then it, it collapses down the road. Uh, your plan would be on top of the existing Social yeah, Security? Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I think we could do it on top of the uh, existing Social Security. There's an executive of one of the uh, large investment companies in New York, Tony James, who's written about this extensively and I think is, makes a pretty compelling point. Uh, I mean, I think we should relook at how we do all our taxes, right? We're the only industrial country that doesn't do a VAT tax. So why aren't we looking at something like that to take over some of the larger uh, functions of the, the challenge us with funding? And then we can be more strategic in the, in the interstices. Well, would, you, uh, would your tax plan tax retirement income, like Social Security benefits, pensions, 401ks, Roth, IRAs? Um, should those, should the, that retirement income be taxed? And if so, should there be a tax on how much, on, on the amount of retirement income that would be taxed? Um, and that is a complicated question. It's probably not just a yes or a no, because it, some of those, uh, I think, should depend on, on how wealthy someone is. But in most cases, in a number of those, they've already uh, paid tax. Now, if it's, if it's one of the sheltered tax areas, uh, it, it, it's not unreasonable to think that there should be some tax paid along the way if, if that's necessary. That being, that being said, uh, we need to look at the, the entire tax system holistically. And if we're going to, and I don't think we have to make massive changes, but if we're going to make you know, one or two changes, like a VAT or something like that, we should make sure and, and, and modulate how it affects the rest of our tax system. There are tons of state and federal laws about gender discrimination. As a business person, what do you think would be the most effective standard law to address age discrimination? And how do you get private sector businesses to adhere to it? Uh, absolutely. The, I met a guy uh, yesterday who's 75 and still working because she, for, for specific reasons, needs to keep working. Um, his retirement got washed away in, in 2007, 2008, 2009. Uh, and he's, as he said, he's lucky. He's got a job where he's successful and, and, and you know, really adding value to that enterprise. Too often there is a bias. And I have s several good friends in Colorado who are talented, they're experienced, um, and they're ready to work, and they cannot find a job, and again and again and again, they can't even get a job interview. Uh, how you put that in a law, uh, again, I'm not a lawyer. I think, I think I'm one of the only people running who's not a lawyer. As a matter of fact, I'm the opposite of Trump. You know, I started 20 businesses, I had 250 investors, I had a million customers a year. I've never even sued anybody. <laughs> I've never been sued. Um, but I, 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 let me just let me finish that question. There are ways to do, and, 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 and obviously with this country is gaining experience every day in how we protect people against bias. And so I'd want to make sure that you had, you know, talented, experienced lawyers so you don't create unintended consequences by poorly written laws. 
We are out of time, but I want to give you uh, one free minute to just wrap up here and uh, give, us, give us your final word. Well, thank you so much for having me, and thank you so much for all of you represent AARP. Uh, you know, when I turned 50, it was right when I became mayor, and I got, I, I got signed up on it. And what I loved was seeing all the, all the talent, and, and, the, and the magazine would, I'd take it out, it was a great political prop, so I could show people uh, that I was wise enough to be mayor. Uh, I think what, what the country needs to recognize is that we all have talents that don't necessarily diminish as rapidly as some people think they do. And I think we need more opportunity. I, like, I watch Willie Nelson, I used to probably smoke pot every day of his adult life, and <laughs> Willie Nelson's one of the only musicians out there, when he plays, he doesn't have a teleprompter telling him the lyrics. He still remembers the lyrics of all his songs. I mean, we need to create opportunity where all of us can, can, can flourish and, 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 and blossom and move into, you know, I've had three different careers. I was a geologist, uh, a, a restaurant owner for 15 years, uh, an entrepreneur, and then I'm mayor and a governor. I'm not sure I'm, what I'm going to do next, but I want to have a shot at doing it. And I think we should all demand that for ourselves and our neighbors. All right. Thank you, Governor. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Governor. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.